This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I it felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Jody Beggs. The story was recorded in December 2013 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme was Ouch. So, about five years ago, I decided that I want to get a tattoo. Now, at the ripe old age of 29 at this point, I know that I'm kind of behind the curve with this a little bit, but I wanted to wait. I wanted something that would be sort of clever, meaningful. I didn't just want to be that person that said, oh, look, I got a dolphin on my ankle, or I got the Chinese characters that I really think have some deep meaning, but really say I'm a cheeseburger or something like that. So I want to wait until this is the right thing. And I finally thought about something that seemed really awesome. So... Like a good Cantabrigian, walked about a few blocks away from here to Chameleon, the tattoo shop right near the Harvard Square tea stop. And I go in, and I explain what I want. And to my surprise, the woman working at the desk said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Now, as an economist, I'm obviously both perplexed and frustrated by the apparent difficulty in conducting a mutually beneficial exchange of money for various goods and services. So I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to push this a little bit further. So I said, well, okay, well, why not? And the explanation that I got was that they wouldn't do tattoos on someone that weren't easy to hide with clothing unless that person had tattoos everywhere else already. So I guess if it's the only open space, it's okay. I don't really get the logic of that. So I kept asking these questions. And for context, I'm asking questions to someone who, by my guess, was about 22 years old and looked pretty much exactly like what you would expect someone working the desk at a tattoo parlor in Harvard Square to look like. My apologies if you were in the audience somewhere and remember this. But she goes on to say, well, so here's the problem. We as an organization don't want to be responsible for someone not being able to get a job because of their tattoo. And I said, well, actually, that's not a problem. I have a job. And in fact, the tattoo I want is related to my job. And that was not convincing. She's like, no, 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 no. You, you don't understand. People that make hiring decisions in this world, well, they're of a different generation than we are. They don't really get it. And I'm sitting there thinking, first, tattoos have been around for a long time, so I'm not sure what that would have to do with anything. Second, there is no we generation in this story at all. So I'm getting more and more frustrated. And I notice in one of the tattoo, we'll call it an office, because I don't really know what the right word is, that there's one of the tattoo artists sitting there without a client. So he's just sitting there doing um, some paperwork or something. So I just ignore the desk person, walk into this office, and start asking similar questions and say, hey, this is what I want. And with the tattoo artist, I still got objections, but those objections were of a different sort. The first objection was the skin that I wanted tattooed didn't necessarily hold ink well, so that there was some chance that we'd go through this whole process, it would go try to heal, and part of it just would be missing, that it just wouldn't be there. So that's one problem. Second problem is that I wanted something that didn't have a black outline. And fun fact, so you said you weren't going to learn anything, and I'm breaking that rule. Black tattoo ink has carbon, and the rest of the colors don't, is what I was told. So the carbon bonds better, which is why it's used as an outline, so things don't spread over time. 
Therefore, if you have a tattoo that doesn't have a black outline over time, it will spread, which is usually not ideal. I was like, oh, fun fact, I learned something. I still want what I want. The third objection, keeping within tonight's theme, is that it would really hurt. So I said, okay, I'm listening to what you say, and let's say I've pondered this, and I'm fine with that. Can we proceed? And he's thinking about it, and then, of course, he asks a question that he probably, in retrospect, regrets. He asks, well, why do you want this anyway? So I told him the following story. So when I was little, my parents lived in a fairly rural suburb of Youngstown, Ohio, a city famous for, as far as I can tell, a university with a Division 1A football team, Go Fighting Penguins, and not a whole lot else. So there was only one school, and I was in kindergarten, and because there was only one school, it was a pretty far distance between our fairly rural house to the school. So I'd have to take the bus for about probably 20 or 30 minutes every day. And my mom didn't want to drive me to school every day because there's a bus that goes right by our house, which makes sense. But she was sort of concerned about her then four-year-old child taking the school bus by herself. Okay, that seems like a reasonable concern. So she gave me a number of rules and advice and things to do. And one of the things that she told me because apparently she was afraid of me getting molested on the school bus, which I know now, but you don't really give context to a kindergartner. So she just gives me this blanket statement. She says, okay, if someone touches you in a way that makes you uncomfortable, you have to stand up for yourself. So rather than, you know, now we have, if you see something, say something. This is like, if you feel something, say something, I suppose. But she was very specific. And she said, Stand up as straight as you can and make yourself seem as big as you can. And then say no in your biggest voice. I don't really know that that would have accomplished anything, but hey, it's some advice, right? So I keep going back and forth to school. Fun fact, no one tried to molest me, so that was good. But then I'm in kindergarten, and I learned that one fundamental skill that people learn in kindergarten is telling their left hand from their right hand. Now, apparently, kindergartners are not advanced enough to know their letters, so you can't simply say, hey, put your hands up, your thumb and your forefinger, the one that makes an L is your left hand. That would be too simple. So what does my teacher do instead? She has the brilliant idea of putting a stamp on the student's right hands and saying, this is your right hand. And we're going to keep doing this so you have this reminder that the hand with the stamp is your right hand. Okay. Now... There's certain things that you don't know whether you're going to like them or not until they happen to you. But apparently, even at the age of four, I had a pretty intuitive understanding of the fact that I hate hand stamps. (laughs) I still do. You know, you you go to a bar or a club and they put the hand stamp on and it smears everywhere and it gets in those little crevices in your skin and you realize you had these tiny wrinkles where you didn't really think you had wrinkles and then you start feeling bad about yourself. It never really washes off perfectly and then the next day at work, you have people giving sideways glances at your hand being like, oh, where were you last night? It's just all together bad. And this was my first taste of realizing that this in fact sucks. So the teacher puts on the hand stamp and I was miserable. So I don't know what to do about this. But my kindergartner self didn't, I don't know, think to go to the restroom and wash it off. So what ended up happening was over the course of the rest of the day, I decided I was going to lick off the hand stamp. <laughs> so eventually I get home. This apparently took me a while. I get home and I'm just bawling my eyes out. I'm just traumatized by this entire experience. I'm like, Mom, <laughs> hand stamp happened (laughs) crying and my mom was so confused she did not understand what was going on all she could tell is that I'm crying I'm pointing to my hand and oh by the way I look like a chow chow because the stamp was blue and I had spent the last couple hours licking it off so my tongue was blue she said whatever this is it'll go away this problem will go away I'm not engaging in this I'm just going to hug my child say everything's going to be fine and send her back to school the next day So I go back to school. Apparently, it takes more than one day to teach the average kindergartner left from right. So, of course, the next day, the teacher says, we're going to do this again. Except this time, I know what's coming, and I know that I don't like it. 
I also know that I had a rule. If someone is touching you in a way that is making you uncomfortable, you have certain actions you are supposed to follow. So my kindergartner brain is going, rule triggered, actions commence. And I stand up real straight. I say, no. And the teacher's like, what the hell is going on right now? And I just keep saying, I'm like, no. And she's oh, okay, she's sort of exasperated. So we'll, 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 we'll come back to you. And she moves to the next person. Now, I'm not sure whether this is an indication that kindergartners are adept at higher level thinking or whether they just sort of adopt a herd mentality. But then the next person said, no. <laughs> so I would like to think that they're all standing there saying, well, what does she know that we don't know? If she knows something that makes her not want it, we don't want it either. But either way, the end result is that I had inadvertently started a kindergarten mutiny. So the teacher was very frustrated that she lost control over her classroom and that she was having a difficult time teaching students what is, I will agree, an important life skill. You know, left from right, you kind of need it. So my mom gets called in for a parent-teacher conference. Not the first and not the last. And the teacher explains the problem. It says, you have to get your child to behave. Like, I know she doesn't like it, but it's important, and the rest of the students need this, and it's just, it's a disruption. And my mom is so embarrassed. I'm, like, I'm really sorry. I'll figure it out. I will get my child to behave. You will not have this problem anymore. So she comes home. And she's a reasonable person, so A, she realizes that I hadn't actually done anything wrong. I followed exactly the rule that she had given me, that she had told me to execute. So yelling at me was really not on the table. B, she's not the type of person to just say, do something because I said so. And she's always looking for those teachable moments. For example, a couple years prior, so I was about two, my mom, she's an English teacher, so she looked forward to the opportunity to teach me the difference between can and may. Unfortunately, this came up in the context of, mommy, can I stick raisins up my nose? <laughs> Pro tip for all of you who are either parents or potential parents out there, if you are going to use this lesson, I highly advise you start with what you may not do rather than start with what you can do. Because, of course, she said, well, yes, you can stick raisins up your nose, but you may not. And by the time she'd gotten the first half of the sentence out, I had raisins up my nose and had to go to the hospital. So just pro tip right there. So this thought process continues, and she's thinking, okay, I have to get my child to behave. What can I do? So she comes up with an idea, and she says, every time you come home with a hand stamp, I'll give you a quarter. Now... I don't know whether it was because I was in kindergarten or because it was about 1984 and inflation is what it is. But a quarter seemed like a reasonable payment for this. So I said, okay, this is fine. And a few weeks went by. Actually, three weeks by my calculations. Because my mom remembers that she spent $3.75 in quarters on this. So $3.75, yeah, 15 quarters, three weeks of school. And then for some random reason, she had to pick me up at school, and she runs into my teacher. She's very proud of herself because she hasn't heard anything negative. She has not had to go to another conference and so on and so forth. So she's talking to my teacher, and she explains what she's been doing because obviously it's working very well. And the teacher busts out laughing and can't stop. So of course, my mom's like, what? What now? What could possibly be happening? And the teacher just looks at my mom and says, well, I stopped giving the hand stamps two weeks ago. <laughs> so what was actually happening was that once the teacher stopped giving the hand stamps, I found other students that had stamps in their desk and other means of acquiring these hand stamps so that I could come home and get my quarter. <laughs> Makes perfect sense in my mind. Now, fast forward 30 or so years, and it's my job to teach people about behavioral responses to incentives and how incentives can backfire even when they're set up with the best of intentions. 
So I figured that this is a really good teachable moment from my perspective and something that I and others should be reminded of on a regular basis. And also I like being reminded of my mom. So it stands to reason that said tattoo would be of something that looks like a stamp on my right hand. So I called my mom and I asked, okay, those hand stamps that we talk about, what were they? And she said that they were stars. Or she said, more specifically, the legitimate ones were stars. The rest of them were just random things. At which point I asked, didn't that kind of tip you off a little bit? <laughs> but, but anyway, it's fine. Water under the bridge. So she answered this question. And that's ultimately what I was asking for. And after I explained this story to that tattoo artist, he was like, okay, that's kind of funny. You know, be amused. But like, you've been talking at me for like five minutes now. We will give you what you want. And as you can see, it worked decently well. It's still here, right? So after this all transpired, it occurred to me that I hadn't told my parents that this was happening, and I actually didn't know a whole lot about their feelings regarding tattoos. I mean, they're kind of open-minded people, but you never know. So I'm like, huh, how do I, how do I broach this subject? So again, as an economist, I did the thing that came naturally to me, I made an Excel spreadsheet. Specifically, I looked up actuarial tables of life expectancies and projections of interest rates in order to calculate the present discounted value of getting a quarter every day, basically forever, because that's what tattoos are, right? Put this into a spreadsheet. I sent the spreadsheet a picture of my hand and an invoice for $1,600 to my mother. <laughs> Her response was pretty much exactly what you're guessing, along with a few choice words that I don't usually hear from her. So, in a, you know, she obviously thinks the story is funny and that there's a teachable moment in there. But one of the things I noticed after telling the story a few times, after talking about it, was that she felt sort of silly. Like, she likes being a part of this story, but then she's like, well, I was outsmarted by a kindergartner, and I don't know how I feel about that. And so I was quick to remind her that the reason this story is interesting or relevant in a repeated sense especially is because that's something that almost everyone does, that she's not alone in this at all. And, you know, I can understand how she would feel silly you know, she's a very smart lady. I mean, she even had one of her college professors tell her that she was really good at math for a girl. Again, go fighting penguins. So she didn't like to think that she would be somewhat deficient in any way, right? So in order to make her feel better, I actually sent her a clip from the Freakonomics movie. So you've heard of the book Freakonomics. It was actually made into a documentary. And in this documentary... University of Chicago economist Steve Levitt, also very smart guy, the guy who wrote Freakonomics, is telling a story about trying to toilet train his daughter. And again, he works with incentives all the time, so he's posed with the problem that his daughter clearly knows how to use the toilet, but she doesn't want to. He says, well, what do I do? I study incentives. So let's set up an incentive. So he thought about what his daughter was really into at that point in time. That thing was M&M's. So we said, okay, every time you use the potty, I'll give you some M&Ms. Now, if you've been paying attention, you can probably guess what happened. The incentive worked pretty well for a few days, and then his daughter figured out how to pee three drops at a time every three minutes. <laughs> so amazing bladder control from someone who previously couldn't even use the potty properly. But he says, well, wait a minute. This is what I do for a living. I've literally said the words. If you figure out what people's incentives are, you can figure out how to make them behave how you want to behave. And then even I failed to put that into action in my own life with my own child. So I show this to my mom, and then she responds to me. She said, well, yeah, actually, that does make me feel a lot better. That said, you're still not getting your $1,600. Thank you.
That was Jody Beggs. Jody is an economist and writer whose focus is on making economics accessible and interesting to both students and a general audience. Jody is currently a lecturer at Northeastern University, where she teaches economics to both economics and music industry students. She's also the assistant director of research at Northeastern University's Create Center, where she conducts research in the music industry. Outside of the classroom, Jody teaches economics on her website, Economists Do It With Models, where she blogs about fun economic stuff and utilizes the online environment to make education content freely available to students and non-students alike. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love this podcast, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, and to Douglas Adams for teaching me the legend of Magrathea, even if I didn't grow up to become an economist. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.